All right, so in three, two. Good afternoon, my name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Monday, October 10th, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at the discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board committee members will say their names before making and seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda topic. Ms. Faya, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McWillian. I apologize, I'm having technology issues, so I'm on Mr. Hartlove's computer. So, um, Mr. McWillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Here. Mr. Offerman? Here. Uh, Dr. Maria Miarbo? Ms. Shira Anderson? Here. Mr. Pedro Agosto? Dr. Mario Boswell McCormick? Ms. Mildred Charlie Green? Mr. Michael Zarchin? Mr. Chris Hartlove? Ms. Margaret Ann Howie? Ms. Anna Rungvark Sengnoon? Here. Dr. Jeffrey Holmes? Mr. James Corns? Mr. Pete Dixit? Here. Ms. Megan Shea? Ms. Jennifer Kraft? Here. Ms. Jamie Hetzler? Mr. Merrill Plate, Ms. Michelle Stansberry, Ms. Melanie Webster, here. Mr. John Salerno, here. Mr. Kimberly, Miss, I'm sorry, Miss Kimberly Kerr, Kerr, here. If there are additional staff that are participating. Can you please state your name at this time? Oh, sorry, Melissa. This is Melissa Wistet. Anyone else? All right, Mr. Miragai, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kuhn, I have a question for you. I know you submitted questions on uh, specific items. Do you want to bring those up as we approach each contract? Uh, yes. Okay, cool. Okay. Mr. Hartlove, please state your name for the record and proceed with contract ARA 212 19, public notice K through 3 phonics program. Sure. Uh, my name is Chris Hartlove. I am the Chief Financial Officer for Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, Contract ARA 212-19, this contract modification will provide for the continued use of a comprehensive foundational skills reading program with digital resources to support grades K through three students to improve reading achievement for the Office of English Language Arts. Approval is requested to increase spending authority by $3,240,000, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to nine million two hundred forty thousand dollars with one awarded contract approval by the board on tuesday june 11th 2019. thank you board members any questions uh, mr mcmillian i have questions that i had shared so i'll just ask them yes please uh so the first question is is open court delivering results uh, so thank you for that question. We do believe it is delivering results and um, I had sent along some data. I guess you haven't received it yet, but what I was able to do was um, compile our DIPLS data, which is really 
an indication of our implementation of open court. And so when we really think about how um, we position open court with Dibbles, open court is the curriculum that we're using um, and how it supports literacy development. And so what Dibbles does is it measures um, how students are doing with their foundational skills with concepts of print, uh, phonological awareness, phonics, word recognition, and fluency. And so as a result of Dibbles screening, which uh, we were able to do in K and 1 last year, uh, we actually were able to see a measurable increase. So in kindergarten, we moved from 34% of students meeting what is considered core or benchmark. So they're reading where we would expect them to, to by the end of the year, 58% of our students were meeting uh, core and benchmark. And at the same time, we were able to reduce the number of kindergarten students in needs of, of intensive support um, from 49%, so almost half of our students were in need of uh, intensive support, down to 30% by the end of the year. In first grade, we increased from 40% of students at the beginning of the year meeting core or benchmark to 58% of students meeting core or benchmark by the end of the year. And at the same time in first grade, we were able to move from 47% of students needing intensive support to 30% of students being able to receive intensive support. And Mr. Kuhn, I can make sure you get those data graphs so you can see the beginning, mid and end of year growth uh, for Dibbles. This year, we've decided to also test second grade. So that was last year, we only did K and one, which is what is required by the Re Ready to Read Act. Um, but we felt it was really important to continue to test our students and make sure they were meeting core benchmark goals. So we will actually be testing in second grade this year also. OK, well, I appreciate that. I'm actually looking at the Ready to Read Act annual data from 2020 to 2021. Is this what your your the data that you're talking about? No, so this was our end of the year Dibbles data for uh, the school year 21-22. Oh, OK, so where where does someone find that online? Um, Is it available to the public? I don't know that they have we've released a, a public report yet, but I think that's something that I can go back to Dr. McComas and ask um, what what next steps would be with that. Um, but we certainly um, can provide you that data, um, you know, internally right now and then figure out how we can get that on our um, website for the public. OK, thank you. So I appreciate the, the background. Um, my next question is why? Are we spending three million dollars more on it? Has has is that I don't understand. Is is there more training going on? Are we extending the contract? Are we getting more? What's the three million dollar increase for? Yeah, it's a great question. So when schools closed down for the pandemic, uh, what we found was um, that every school. Um, did not have a one to one correspondence of teacher materials to teachers. So, for example, let's say they had four first grade teachers. There was also a special education teacher. Sometimes there was an English language learner teacher. Uh, sometimes there was a self contained class. Um, what we found is schools had been sharing materials. When everyone went home and was teaching from home, we had to have a one on one correspondence. Every single teacher had to have one. At the same time, remember that fall we stood up the virtual learning program. These were teachers that we had no materials for and so every single teacher in grades K through three that were hired for the virtual learning program had to be purchased teacher kits and all of the ancillary materials. And so really the biggest increase of spending had to do with the fact that we had to provision for everybody being able to teach from home for that period of time which was not a bad thing because what that meant is moving forward is that every single teacher that is giving instruction in open court has their own teacher kit and we're not like having teachers share materials. So when the ELL teacher pulls out a small group, she has her own teaching material. She's not saying to the teacher, hey, can I borrow your teacher manual for a minute? So when we were able to to really look at where the majority of the expenses came from, it was making sure that every single teacher had their own teacher kit, which really came out of the pandemic and we shut down schools. And so um, that's really where um, a bulk of it came from. 
Um, and also when you do a five year estimate for consumables, I think we were under our estimate a little bit. And so even just the student consumables took a majority of the, the fund went to teachers, but then also a little bit for student consumables with under estimation. Thank you for the explanation. Um, just so I'm clear. When we initially budgeted and purchased these materials, um, it was it was structured not basically so that each school would get materials um, and then those materials would be shared between teachers. Is that is that the correct understanding? Um, and so I think, um, and this was a little bit before me, but I mean, obviously I, I talked to uh, Pam and Megan. Um, so you do your best estimate based on the number of teachers. Like when you get the teaching grid and you're trying to figure out who's teaching classes and you look at the, the grid and you're like, okay, um, when we look in focus, we see this many teachers. The problem is, an, uh, an ELL teacher or a special education teacher might not be marked as a teacher of record. And I think that's where our underestimate came in. Um, also, the virtual learning program was completely new. And so those teachers weren't ever accounted for when we had to purchase those kits. Um, what I can tell you is moving forward, we have been trying to get a much better handle on when we're ordering teacher kits, the number of teachers in a building, even if there are uh, a non teacher of record so that we don't underestimate in that same way moving forward. OK, and just lastly, um, and this will be my last question on this, I hope um, you, you mentioned consumables, right? Yes. Um, and <clears throat> I just want to I want to be clear when when the pandemic hit and we weren't actually face to face with anyone my my thought would be that consumables would not be consumed since we were not sending things home i don't know we, i'm asking this is kind of a question we, yeah no it's a no mr kuhn it's a great question we actually arranged for pickups for um students um and uh the open court consumables as well as some decodable books were things that we actually made sure um our k-3 students had um in some cases some schools even provided letter tiles for the students during the open court part of the lesson and so um we actually did distribute um uh, uh, consumables that year um for students and so we had pickup sites at every school so that they could get those materials and continue instruction um that well, year that's, without that's good to hear yeah yeah of course Okay, committee members, any additional questions? Yes, Mr. McMillian, this is Ms. Hen. Yes, please. Thank you, um, and thank you for those questions, Mr. Kuhn. I appreciate it, um, and thank you for the explanation. Um, I'm still trying to make sense of the numbers myself and understanding, and, and perhaps it is just um, an issue of estimating with the amount that the board received. That's the only explanation I'm coming up with because, I'm sorry, the numbers don't, don't add up in terms of why this additional spending authority is required, other than the fact that we got a poor estimate to begin with. So um, obviously we want the materials in the hands of, of our teachers and that need them, but the explanation that teachers are sharing this and that, the numbers don't add up. So if it is a case of um, we underestimated what we needed, just you know, level with us if that's the case, fine if it's something else that that we weren't expecting if there's a vendor cost increase if you know whatever if there's something else we need to know that but otherwise um i would hope that we would be receiving more accurate estimates moving forward so that's my only i wanted to express that concern and otherwise no problem but yeah, the explanation doesn't add up for me Right, Ms. Hen. So I, let me let me say it. If I, I I maybe I was a little long winded. We definitely and and Dr. Wolf said, you know, we underestimated um, based on using focus and looking at teachers of record. But what the problem is is that if every school also has 
three or four ancillary teachers that are not considered what we call teacher of record. And then you do that through 110 elementary schools, it adds up. And so um, I, I appreciate that. And I can say for sure, we have put other methods into place now to try to capture when we're doing estimates that to make sure that we really do have an accurate reflection of um, what we might need year to year and then just like when a teacher kit needs to be replaced because pieces go missing a teacher leaves a school we don't you know like all the pieces aren't there there's just you know you you have to account for that and so miss hen you're right i think that it was an inaccurate estimate and we um are really going to try to do better as we move forward with our numbers thank you mr offerman any questions There being no further questions, we will proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartloff, please proceed with presenting LKO-415-18 pre-qualification of child care providers. Sure, uh, Mr. McMillian. Uh, this is a consent to assignment of this contract from Hotspots Extended Care Program to Caladay School Age Programs. Are there any questions, committee members? There being no further questions, we will proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlaw, please proceed with presenting COH-900-22, Conditional Teaching, Math Accelerated Certification, Certification for Teaching Programs. Uh, yes. This contract modification will provide for an expansion of the scope of the contract to include social studies, science, music, art, and world language conditional uh, certificated teachers. Approval is requested to expand the content area of the program to those areas. So there's no there's no dollar cost involved. It's just expanding uh, the um, uh, the scope of the contract. Are there any questions, committee members? Um, this is Mr. Kuhn. I've, I've got a question. Yes, please. So it looks as if there are a number of cohorts where this is, there are changes going on for the next, I think, seven items, correct? Correct. Okay. So can someone just give me an overview so I don't have to ask this question mm -hmm. like seven different times, what's happening and why? And, and if we were focused on math and English, right, which we seem to have, we have some pretty poor scores in math and English, so I fully understand and support focusing there. I'm just curious as to why we're shifting or changing at this point to other areas. If we're just not spending the money and therefore we're opening up wider, I mean, please just explain. Uh, will do. I think we have uh, folks on the call that can help us out. And, and I wanted to uh, thank you, Mr. Kuhn, and uh, for providing the questions in advance because it's certainly helpful to us to be able to make sure we get a good answer for you. And now it's the time to give you the good answer. So let's let's see who's out there. And if not, I can turn to um, Ms. Webster. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Sure, no problem. Um, what has happened is as we have sought to hire additional teachers, not only are we hiring math and English teachers, but we're also hiring social studies and science teachers. And many of these teachers do not have the qualifications um, to enable them to be highly qualified or even hold a teaching certificate. So these contracts will help them get that highly qualified um, OK, so that covers three or, and four. Right? Or, their, or their certificate in the area that they're work currently teaching. OK, so that explains the request regarding number three and number four, right? Yes, the sir. conditional teaching accelerated. OK, I don't want I, I will. I have questions for five, six and seven and eight, but I have no more questions for this. Thank you. Committee members, any additional questions? There being no further questions, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartloff, please proceed with presenting. Sure, uh, the next one, is, uh, as Mr. Kuhn had mentioned, is very similar. Uh, COH 901-22 Conditional Teaching English Accelerated Certification uh, 
for teaching program. The last one was uh, math. This is English and it's the exact same um, uh, situation with this one. Any questions? Mr. Hartlove, please proceed with presenting the next item. Uh, next contract is COH-921-22 Master, Master of Arts in Teaching Mathematics Education. Um, this is uh, this contract modification will provide for an expansion of the scope of the contract to include social studies and science conditional certified teachers. So its approval is requested to expand the content area of the program. Mr. Cohn. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, so I was taking a look at this and this this is to to modify and add more money to the contract. That's that's the first question. Is that is that accurate or is it just to to change what what, what the money can be used for? Your, your second, it's just to change what the money can be used for. OK, great. All right, that helps. Um, so my question is really centered on the reasoning and um, as to and, and maybe there are there are other cohorts that aren't being discussed here, but these seem to be focused on uh, contract with Bowie State uh, University and <clears throat> there are many other universities that are actually in Baltimore County or closer. So my, my real question was, you know, my first question is, is are these is is it were we unable to have, say, Towson University or Morgan State or Loyola or Johns Hopkins provide this? Because I know that all of those universities, like Bowie State's and PG County, and I, I'm not sure, and I guess that's a question I have also, is this basically um, an in-person type of a learning or is it, you know, uh, over Zoom or whatever. So I'm tr I'm just trying to understand because if a teacher had to work and then go to class at night in PG County, that could make it very difficult to get there versus in Towson or, you know, in, you know, in northern Baltimore City, you know, it could be a lot easier to get there. So this that's my like my question is to, you know, why why are we going further from Baltimore County? Uh, so just, you know, if you could address that, that'd be great. Uh, Ms. Ms. Webster, I don't know if you want to take that sure. one. Sure, sure, I can address that. Uh, yes, thank you for that question, Mr. Kuhn. Yeah, these are virtual classes. They are synchronous, which means there is a teacher teaching the class, um, but it will be over an electronic platform. If there is a need to do an in-person meeting during the course of these cohorts, we will find a Baltimore County location for them. Um, we do ask all of the area colleges and universities for proposals based on the needs that we have in any given year. Um, we look at the programs that they offer, the specializations, the teachers that they may have available, as well as the cost of the individual programs. But in answer to your to your main question, these are being held virtually. And to, to follow on, do I, I know we've approved multiple cohorts for masters and other, you know, uh, you know, professional development for teachers. Um, so my and, and I believe we've kind of we, we've done it to all sorts of colleges in the area. So I, I that's kind of the question and part of my reason for asking it because I know we've done it, <laughs> right? Uh, so are are there various cohorts or are these the only ones left that we have? Because this is a three year commitment here. It's going to 2025, right? So you, you don't just sit there and take all the classes you need in a year. That's just not possible, especially for someone working full time. So I'm just trying to understand, you know, somebody's path through this. Uh, it's probably I don't know how many spots. Do we know that? Do you know how many spots I this $324,000 is? I believe most of the cohorts are approximately 30. Um, 30 spots. 30 staff members that are able to participate. Being that this one is virtual, it might be higher than that. I don't have that specific number in front of me. Um, 
we do the cohorts are structured so that a student can or a staff member can look for the specialty and what they want to accomplish and hopefully find a cohort that specifically meets their needs. The cohort is planned so that the at the end of that time after they take all of the classes that are involved, they will either end up with their masters or their certificate um, or they will be well on their way to achieving one of those goals. And I, and I think one of the good things about these um, cohorts is um, we get I, and I'm probably going out on a limb a little bit here, but we tend to get better pricing because we're guaranteeing, you know, a whole class of students to the to the school um, and they like that. Um, otherwise, it's kind of, you know, your typical business. They, they put a class out there and they're not sure how many students are going to sign up this. They kind of they get a better feel. Um, so therefore we can we tend to get better pricing as well. So so that's part of this is, is is certainly the pricing and the fact that the students don't have to to drive to attend. All right, thank you. Any additional questions, committee members? There being no further questions, we will proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlaw, please proceed with contract number six. OK, contract number six is very similar to the last contract, but it's for English. It's the uh, COH-920-22 Masters of Arts in Teaching English Education. Uh, again, it's very similar. It's also, I believe, at uh, Bowie State University. Committee members, any questions? There being no further questions, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlaw, please proceed with contract number seven. Um, yes, uh, the next contract is COH-912-22 CCBC Secondary English Cohort uh, 2022. Uh, approval is requested to extend the contract for four months, and I believe that's uh, due to a delayed start to the cohort. Any questions? There being no further questions, we will proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove, please proceed with presenting contract number eight. COH-900-23 Early Childhood slash Special Education Paraprofessional Three-Year Cohort. Uh, this is a new cooperative administrative administration of programs contract for a cohort for early childhood special education paraprofessional. Approval is requested for a three year, eight month contract and a spending authority of $360,000. Any questions, committee members? There being no further questions, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlaw, please proceed with presenting contract number nine. COH-901-23 Early Childhood Special Education Paraprofessional Five-Year Cohort. This is a new cooperative administration of programs contract for a cohort in early childhood special education. Approval is requested for a four-year, eight-month contract and, spend, and contract spending authority of $360,000. Questions? Uh, Mr. Mc Million, I have yes. a, <clears throat> just a quick question. Yes, um, please. So this is, it, it says um, early childhood special education. Is that, I, I'm just trying to understand like the age group we're looking at. Are we targeting this for people that are handling like pre-K folks or is this through like third grade? I'm just trying to understand. Um, good question, uh, Ms. Webster. I don't know if you have that information. Sorry, I do not have the focus age range for this. That is something we'd have to get. Yeah, make a follow up. I'm, it's not a burning question. I'm just curious as to because we had this is a five year cohort, correct? The one previous of them one is, is a three is year three cohort. Three and one is five, yeah. yes. This one's five, so, I, and they're both for paraprofessionals. Yes, sir. Okay, so these are are people that are in classrooms helping with with teachers, but they're not actual teachers, correct? Yes, sir. Right. So we're basically upskilling the paraprofessionals. That is correct. 
All right, somebody else wants to speak. Go ahead. Hi, it's Melissa. Um, I'm, I am i don't know the details of the contract, but I can share with you that for the Blueprint for Maryland's Future, a requirement for the classroom um, assistant in pre-kindergarten and preschool, so that'd be for three-year-olds and four-year-olds, is that they are required to have an associate's degree or a child development associate's degree. So it sounds like this contract is trying to put a cohort of people together for them to be able to obtain what is going to be required in the blueprint for Maryland's future. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. One sure. one tangential question. Um, does the blueprint um, also expand uh, pre-K throughout Maryland? It requires that we offer full day sessions to students that meet up to 300% poverty who are three and four years old. And it, that can be within our public schools or with a private provider, but both are still required to have that um, the same credentialing. So the assistant in the classroom meeting the associate's degree or the child development associates is the same for both. Thank you. Sure. Any additional questions, committee members? There being no further questions, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlaw, please proceed with presenting contract number 10. Okay, and we'll switch gears to workers' comp, KSH-342-18 Workers' Compensation Claims Administration Service. Um, and the key on this one is, is this is uh, um, inclusion of claims reimbursement, which is a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Uh, the contract modifica modification will provide for the continue, continued administration of workers' compensation claims through a third party administrator and the inclusion of claims reimbursement for uh, the Office of Human Resources Operations. So we're trying to be a little bit more transparent. Nothing's really changed with how we're doing our business here. We just uh, thought it was more uh, transparent to show that um, uh, the contractor pays uh, claims on our behalf. So these dollars really are flowing through. And in the past, we didn't bring that part of the contract and we probably should have. Community members, any questions? There being no further questions, we uh, will. I'm sorry, John. Excuse me. John, John it put it in yeah. the uh, chat. Uh, actually, question. my question was about the massive difference in cost, but I think you just answered that. Thank you. And Mr. Hartlove, just to clarify, I, I I think I had the same question, but yes. what what you're in essence saying is the administration right um, previously was costing us a, a little over two million dollars a year Correct. and there are there's about 50 plus million dollars flowing through well I, I this is broken out over years right so so we're talking about x number of dollars that's flowing through the system to handle workers compensation claims Correct. Yeah, they're paying on our behalf. So the, the dollars are, 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 are technically they're going to employees, um, but they are, uh, you know, they're going through the, the contractor. But the just so I'm clear with the money, <laughs> they're writing the checks. They're not holding the money. Correct. No, no, they are not holding the money. No. OK, thank you. Mr. Offerman, I'm sorry that I missed your question previously. Any additional questions? There being no further questions, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove, please proceed with presenting contract number 11. Uh, JBO-703-19 Field Trip Transportation Services, and this is uh, simply a consent to assignment um, of the contract from Paul D. Rill to Paul D. Rill Incorporated. Mr. Offerman has a question, please. Yes. Uh, so I uh, am, am I to assume that we are paying for all field trip transportation now directly ourselves? Um, that's a good question, and I'm not sure of the answer whether we're collecting from students. Ms. Webster, if, do you have that? 
We we do collect from students and pay for it. I know that we do pay for students who meet certain criteria, but overall this we are passing the, the cost through to the student. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? There being no further questions, we proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove, please proceed with presenting contract number 12. Sure, uh, GDA-300-23, purchase of large kitchen equipment. Um, this is a new competitively bid contract for large kitchen equipment for the Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with five recommended bidders and a contract spending authority of $2.5 million. The items uh, are, some examples are, uh, they include walk-in, refrigerators, steam, steamers, ovens, warming cabinets, milk coolers, etc. Any questions, committee members? There being no further questions, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove, please proceed with presenting contract uh, number 13. Mr. McMillian. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ms. Han. I'm sorry, I was trying to get off mute. I had a question on the last contract. Yes, please. GDA 300-23. Yes, please. Um, the board, thank you. The board recently approved another contract for kitchen equipment. I'm, I'm wondering how this is different um, than that one. If this is different equipment or what, what is different about this one? Um, I am not sure of the answer to that. Um, there's Ms. Webster again. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure what was approved recently, so I need to go back and do a little research. Okay, but, because it, but, it looks um, identical to one we approved. It included large appliances. Um, the information we received um, said that this is a new competitive, competitively bid contract, so it doesn't look like it's replacing um, the previous contract. So I was curious as to why we didn't purchase under the other one. I'm sorry, Mr. Harlow. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Um, yeah, and just be just keep in mind when we bid these out doesn't mean that we buy. These are just options for our food sure, sure. Uh, and nutrition. So it may be that there's something here that wasn't included. Um, and I, I, I'm just kind of, um, you know, brainstorming on what the differences could be. And I thought um, um, our food service supervisor was on, but uh, maybe she's not um, on. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, this is John Salerno. I am with Food and Nutrition. Um, hey, I, I am not familiar with another contract of this sort pertaining to food and nutrition. So I don't know if it's possibly a contract that was with the culinary department or another division, but um, this is the only one I'm aware of for food and nutrition service. Oh, OK, and they're, they're different. Um, now that I look at it, it's different um, providers, different bidders. So. I'll, I can dig up the the other contract. Not a big deal if if someone were aware of it. Um, I thought you could possibly tell me the difference. We can move on, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hartlove. Please proceed with presenting contract number thirteen. Sure. Uh, CWA-101-23 screen printing and embroidery for apparel and accessories. This is a new competitively bid contract for screen printing and embroidery for apparel and accessories for schools and offices. This contract will provide for the purchase of imprinted and embroidered apparel and wearable accessories for schools and offices. Products include t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, hats, jackets, and socks. Mr. Kuhn, I know you had a question earlier. I, I did, um, just so we're uh, just a kind of clarify things, Mr. Hartlove. I mean, this is more of kind of like a budget accounting type of a question, right? So it says this is categorized as a general fund category, other instructional costs. And we're talking about t-shirts and hoodies, so. Yeah, and when we put a when we put a general fund, uh, when we put an object class on these, we or I'm sorry, a, a general fund category, we we try to pick do our best uh, uh, 
to select what the most used category could be, but it doesn't mean that everything is going to be in that category. But how this links to other instructional costs would be something like if um, the math club at a school decided to buy, sh they decided to buy shirts for the math club that said math club on them, that would be looked at as, as an extracurricular activity. It's part of the curriculum. Uh, it's um, over and above. And any cost that, um, that is contributed, you, you know, you can say it's a little bit, it's a little, you know, a couple steps away from actually educating kids, but it makes them feel good about being in the math club. So it gets to be included under other instructional costs. So those are the types of things that they're talking about. Now, if they're buying shirts for other reasons for administrators or something like that, then that wouldn't be an, that wouldn't be another instructional cost. So it depends on what the, what the, um, the, the items are for. But another thing would be, um, and I'm not sure if that's included here or not, but like Gym uniforms certainly are part of uh, of uh, instruction. Right, and and I'm looking at you know who's this is being awarded to, and most of it's sportswear. Um, so I'm just it, it it's kind of bordering on you know uh, things for teams and things along those lines, and I right. know that. You know, there's a lot of fundraising that goes on across the system uh, with booster groups and what have you to provide things for for students and or they buy them. So I'm not sure if this is kind of like the, um, you know, Mr. Offerman's question earlier about paying for transportation to field trips. If this is a bucket, but in essence, funds are flowing through, you know, based on student purchasing things for clubs and or teams or what have you, and it's this is just the vehicle that they use to get those things. Is, does anyone have any insight into what this is actually used for, or would it combine all of that? Ms. Ms. Webster, I don't know if you were going to weigh in there or not. Um, yeah, it might also be used um, when we open a new school and all the students have on their their new school T-shirt that that um, on that day we cut the ribbon, those t-shirts would all be purchased through this contract. Um, a school might purchase t-shirts for all of the students for sports day. Um, so the students can all feel a sense of community with, with the rest of their peers. Um, that's okay. really how I, this is used. Yeah, and I know Rod, you were an AD and you know, you. You were involved probably managing um, uh, uniforms and things like that. And I see BSN sports and other sports um, type <laughs> uh, uh, providers on this list. So it, it looks like we might use them for, for multiple things um, besides just um, uniforms or, you know, sweatshirts for schools and things like that. But in, in my experience, most of the times, you know, parents are buying their own their own sweatshirts and things along those lines through some club or through some organization in school so that's why i'm, I'm asking these questions to try and get to you know what's the focus of this million dollars <laughs> we're setting aside you know to be spread across you know you know these multiple uh awardees that's that's it yeah some of it is reimbursed um by the by the students or by the parents, um, and some of it is is paid for, uh, perhaps with uh, Title One funds or through the community school program. So it covers a variety of things. Thank you. Yeah, and it is for multiple years too, so it's not a million dollars for a year. So I, hopefully that helps a little bit. Any additional questions? There being no further questions, we'll proceed to the next contract. Good evening, Mr. Dixit. Mr. Dixit, please proceed with presenting contract number 14. Good evening. So the next contract is JBO-701-18, and this is to request an additional amount of $920,000 for electronic parts, supplies, and installation. The term is to extend it by six months and the amount is $920,000. Uh, this modification will allow time for a new solicitation. 
uh, and increase spending authority for the remainder of the contract duration. Committee members, any questions? I will, Ms. Mr. McMillian. This is Ms. Yes. Han. Yes, please, Ms. Han. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Dixit. Good afternoon. Um, would you please provide for the committee some more information about what types of parts are being replaced over six months for nearly a million dollars for schools and offices? What, what are we talking about? Thanks, that's please. a good thank question. You. Good question, and thank you for asking that. This is used for uh, electronic systems, intercoms, public address system, audiovisual clocks and bells. So that's part of the work. There are some additional uh, specific projects that are in the pipeline and depending on the stage of design and uh, what can be done due to uh, supply chain issues also. Woodmore's intercom system is one of the project. Catonsville's scoreboard, Catonsville Middle School, that's another one. Overly, Overly High School's scoreboard inside and outside, that's another project. Um, Kenwood High School's press box is another project that's in the pipeline. So these are some of the, and there are three more projects in the capital request that we have submitted. Depending on when we get approval, uh, if we get approval before the uh, and new end date of the contract, we would like to be to at least be in position to initiate that that purchase order. OK, thank you. And when these projects are initiated, is this something that's part of the checklist? Out of my own curiosity, when it's initiated to ensure that we have um, spending authority for the scope of all of these projects before they're initiated, or, or are we talking about um, overruns? So it's, it's a mix of a lot of things. Some of it could be routine maintenance. Some of it could be uh, a request from a school that has been investigated. And some of them are capital projects that's part of the program that has been approved by the board. Right, that I understand. But so I guess what I'm asking is for the capital projects, when those are initiated, is part of our checklist to ensure that the board has approved adequate spending authority on all of the existing contracts so that if what we anticipate the project costs for those capital projects are covered that, on existing contracts, that then is you wouldn't need to come true. back to the board for additional spending authority unless the maintenance type projects that you mentioned would drive, you know, the increase. So the capital projects and an estimated amount has been approved by the board. Uh, if there is any saving that can be used for other projects and we work with the fiscal authority to do that. If there's additional amount needed, then we go back to our fiscal authorities and ask for additional amount. But the a budget of approximate amount has been approved. OK, and, and the budget's been approved. I understand that with the overall project budget. I guess my question is if if you anticipate needing more at the initiation of a capital project, is it at that point when you would come to the board and say, rather than six months before the contract expires, to come to the board and say, we've got this project for um, the scoreboard. We anticipate we're going to need an additional million on this contract before we get to the, you know, the end of needing it now either request the board grant it or possibly even bid it out because that's a significant amount of work for somebody and we should put it out to competitive bid then before we need it. Is that something that's considered when we, I'm sorry, no. when we um, take that, that work on? So all of those questions are good. Our actions are guided by the procurement policy. If the amount that we need is more than a certain amount, uh, we go back and uh, request a change order that will require board's approval. If the amount is within the contingency of the proposal and it's within the budget amount, then then we can 
we can authorize the contractor to to start the work. Part of the reason we need these contracts is because if you see there are four or five vendors listed here, depending on what kind of system. So in most of the cases, the price is already either negotiated in advance or is on time and material. So we know how much it's going to cost. Uh, so I'm not aware of any amount, uh, any project that exceeded and we had to come back to the board for these type of projects. Thank you. And my last question is, I was just wondering if there's a threshold when you say, OK, we've got a new capital project. Now we. We really should bid this out. And what I'm hearing you say is it's up to procurement practices or laws as to whether or not we bid that out, regardless of whether there's existing or whether whether there's remaining spending authority on an existing contract versus putting it out to bid. So that's a good question. So this our action is guided by several factors. Number one is the time that we have available, the amount that is there, and what is the procurement policy for that particular project? So in some cases, for example, and that doesn't apply to this, if there is a grant for a project, then our focus is that we do it in a timely manner before the expiration of the grant. If we have time to, to design and bid, that is always our first preference. The second preference is the second reason is the need for the project out there in the school. So if there is no functioning intercom system, then obviously the need is urgent. So a lot of factors are considered in our decision, and in the end, it's Mr. Hartlow's department that uh, makes sure that we are in compliance with the procurement policy. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. Thank you. Thank you for asking those questions. Mr. Pete, I'm sorry, but your conversation has stimulated a, a question or two from me. When you mentioned those scoreboards, you know, you know what I've did for 35 years and 25 years at Chesapeake. We needed an outdoor scoreboard at Chesapeake for years. And then after I left, the athletic director that took my place in the Sports Boosters Club, they continued a pursuit of a scoreboard and they, they got a scoreboard within the last uh, probably eight or 10 months. And as far as my understanding is, they raised the money for that scoreboard through a wide range of sources. But when you mention these scoreboards and you mentioned specific schools getting scoreboards, explain to me, are these schools fundraising for these scoreboards or, or is BCPS paying for these scoreboards for sc some scoreboards and not for other scoreboards? Please ex clarify that for me. So. So I don't have the detailed information that you're asking for. I can check that, but the scoreboards, if they are included in the approved budget, so that's one way. The other, they some, in some cases, they raise funds or special project request. That's another source. Uh, in some cases, it's privately funded, 7330 project that board approves as an individual project. So. Depending on what kind of request we have, uh, uh, that's the answer. So I know for sure, for example, for the intercom system at Woodmore that I talked about, that's from the capital program that has been approved. I don't have the other request as to how we got it, but I can check that and I can share that with you later on. That's OK, Mr. Pete, I, that, that intercom. No, that's OK. I I understand, you know, if an elementary school needs an intercom system, I understand they need that to run yeah. their school efficiently. Yes, yes. So I understand that. Any additional questions, committee members? I will now entertain a motion to recommend that items 1 through 14 be moved to the full board for approval. Mr. McMillian, can yeah. we separate B7, oh, please? Thank you. OK, and I saw Ms. Faye come on. Please, please repeat okay. that again, Ms. And I was just reiterating. Separate, thank you. <laughs> would you please separate B7? OK, and which seven is that? I don't see oh, that. Item B, item B7. 
Item B7. Yes, please. So I'll make the motion if you want. So, but so Mr. we're talking Biden. about the CCBC secondary as <laughs> English program, Ms. Hen? Yes, please. I need to recuse myself from that. Okay. So we're looking for a motion for one through six. Is that correct? And eight to fourteen. And all in the same motion. So uh let me get myself together here. Committee members, I will now entertain a motion to recommend that items one through six and eight through 14 be moved to the full board for approval. So moved, Offerman. Second. Second. Okay, outstanding. Uh, Ms. Faya, will you please do a roll call vote? Uh, Mr. Mamelian? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Excuse. OK, that motion passes. Contracts 1 through 6 and 8 through 14 will be moved forward to the board. May I have, I will now entertain a motion to recommend that item 7, contract 7, be moved to the full board for approval. So moved, Kuhn. Second, Offerman. Great. Ms. Faya, please do a roll call vote. <clears throat> Mr. McMillian? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Every right. Thank you. OK. Uh, that motion passes, so contract seven will be moved forward to the board. Any additional questions, committee members? The last item on the agenda is announcements. The next Building and Contracts Committee meeting will be held on Monday, November 7th, 2022 at 5 p.m. Is there any further business? Hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much for joining us, and I appreciate everyone's help. Thank you very much. Thank right, you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Have Thank a great you. evening. Thank you, Ms. Foyer. You too.